thanks very much for coming here today, and uh, thanks to Thais for the, the invitation. Uh, I, I was due to give this a couple of weeks ago as part of the kind of more a broad series on County Armagh, but other circumstances get in the way, so we, re we rescheduled to today. As, as Dez has said, um, in some senses, if you've been following American politics over the last couple of months, um, in some ways, the, the people involved in this, were, I suppose, they, they were kind of the, the, ba the, basket of the basket of intolerables of the 18th century or of 18th century Armagh, certainly not what people liked or, or in many ways would have agreed with their views, but in some sense it's trying to understand what Oak Boys, Steel Boys, Orange Boys, Defenders were at is, is something I think we need to, and we've tried to do a little bit more over the last 20, 30 years. Um, it, you know, crowds it used to be kind of described as the mob, but I think there's a, which really didn't allow you to really distinguish between what people were trying to do or trying to say. So I think in the last, as I say, in the last number of decades, it's become a bit more sophisticated in terms of trying to understand just what drove <coughs> crowds, what were the local particular issues, what were the more general issues that they were tapping into. Um, and County Armagh, I suppose, was one of those places in the 18th century and into the 19th century where crowds of various sorts tended to gather on a, on a quite a regular basis. Um, maybe just to say a little bit more on that, urban crowds were a very different thing from rural crowds. When we're talking here in County Armagh, we're talking predominantly crowds in the countryside. Um, urban crowds tend to be uh, riot over very specific things like um, food supply, prices of coal, um, sometimes uh, artisan and very early trade union type disputes. So they were a very different thing in the towns. Um, like Dublin in particular, but also some other smaller towns, Belfast, Sligo, Cork, places like that in the 18th century. But the rural crowd was a, quite a different um, thing, as we'll see here today. Um, as I say, quite particular here to Armagh. One, one of the other things that I'd like to do um, in this today, it's going to be a bit of a quick whistle-stop tour um, to those four decades, but it, in a sense it gives me an opportunity here as well um, outside of Armagh itself to kind of pay homage to a lot of local historians over the, the last few decades who have done a, a tremendous amount of work to try and uncover this story. Um, going back, probably one of the earliest ones was Father Brenton McAvoy, but you've had more recent people, George Patterson, Patrick Toll, Neil McLean, Janine Behan, Kyla Madden, um, Kevin McMahon would be all crucial people in, that, in uncovering the subterranean history of crowds in Armagh. Um, and they've identified, those historians, uh, a series of distinctive features that mark out Armagh in this period is quite different. The dense settlement um, of the northern part of, part of the county in particular, um, which was the highest in Ireland, and was to intensify due to rapid <coughs> population increase in the last three decades of the 1700s. The dense settlement was associated with and probably allowed to a large extent by the spread of the linen manufacture in mid and north Armagh. Um, you'd, particularly around the markets of Lurgan, Norma, Rich Hill and Tandragee, but in the later 18th century new markets were opening up for linen in Cady, Castlepainey and uh, a very large one in Newry as well. And in a sense um, what linen meant was that far, in some families but three quarters of the uh, same family were working spinning and weaving and were much less reliant on, on farming um, in, those, in those areas. A third feature of Armagh that makes marks it out is the religious geography of the county, probably since going back to the plantation. And I suppose if you're kind of thinking about it, there's three distinct zones in the county. In the south of the county, you had a predominantly, though not exclusively, Catholic um, population. Um, in you had small pockets of uh, Presbyterians and Anglicans in the baronies of Hughes and Aurier. In the middle of the county, then. It was predominantly Presbyterian, but with Catholics and Anglicans there too. And then in the north of the county after the plantation, Anglicans were probably the strongest group. But even here, uh, Catholics provided about 40% of the population um, in the O'Neillant baronies in the north of the county. And in, in a sense, you have this kind of distinct religious mix right across um, the county, which you know, was either a good or a good thing, a diverse thing, or a mess, depending on your point of view. Armagh also, as part of this religious job, we had a very deeply divided, and as a final feature of it, a very deeply divided political elite. 
And it wasn't unusual to turn a county down had it there with the hills and the Stuarts going on at Hammer and Tongs electorate. But Armagh had no one or even two families who were predominant like the Hills and the Stuarts. So you had instead the Brownlows, the Richardson, the Caulfields, the Atchisons, and then the Copes coming up as a new family, slugging it out really since the Williamite Wars. Smaller landlords in this kind of a mix and division, smaller landlords like the Verners, the Blackers, the Mongos, who are all important in this talk, have much greater influence than they might have found elsewhere in the country. Um, in, in the different political contests. And in the polarised political decades of the 1780s and 1790s, this division within the county elite certainly didn't help stability within Armagh. Um, but I suppose when we kind of look at, and we're kind of, 1795 is the close date of the, the talk, what strikes me most of all is really, in a sense, your, is the lead up or not, if you want to put it that way, to the Battle of the Diamond in, on uh, Monday, 21st of September, 1795. Um, a battle is possibly a, a kind of a, a grandiose name for what Charles uh, Teeling later called a rustic encounter. And I think it was that that kind of was my starting point with this, is that if it was a rustic encounter, has it more to do with what went before it um, in County Armagh, or can it be marked out as something that was distinct uh, to, it, to itself um, in 1795? Um, and that's, you know, that's what I try and sort of go through in the talk. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a <coughs> timeline of kind of key events here. And I'll come back and forth through this and other maps as I'm going along. Um, but maybe just before I even get into that, just a, a quick run over. There's been a number of interpretations of what you can see in late 18th century Armagh, much of which revolves around um, what are kind of known as the <coughs> Armagh Troubles of the 1780s and 1790s. And there's probably two main interpretations to kind of think about or keep in your head when you're when you're listening to what I have to say. The first would be that has been a sort of socioeconomic theory that was championed by first Bill Crawford and then David Miller. Um, and in, in their interpretation of it, um, linen and the cash economy that brought in its wake eroded ties of deference within families and also between landlords and tenants. As I said earlier, you know if if families didn't have to rely as much on um, farming to kind of pay their rent and were paying it through the cash economy of um, the linen industry, then that could have an effect in Miller and, and Crawford's eyes on deference within society more generally. And uh, as somebody who's kind of interested in the, the social structure behind crowd activity, it, there's, an appealing, um, there's an appeal to that theory. Um, it's not a unique you know, alongside this, I suppose, they, they point out to the religious mix of Armagh, which can add a sectarian element to that breakdown in deference. The, this is not unique to Ulster, but it's probably more prevalent there than in other parts of the country during the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and in a sense, you can sort of say, in Miller and Crawford's eyes, that the social and economic characteristic means that the Armagh troubles are much more of a part with the longer tradition of agrarian protests as mentioned, Tipperary and the white boys and the right boys there, or the later land war you know, of the 19th century, than with the politics of the 1790s per se. Um, it also might explain why Armagh was quiet while Antrim and Down saw a rebellion in 1798. So that's one theory. Second theory, and it's the challenge to Crawford and Miller, has been what might be the politicisation model pursued by Kevin Whelan, Louis Cullen, Jim Smith, and others. But briefly, this makes Armagh a political case where divisions among the elite, and particularly over the Catholic question, passed down whether by osmosis or by a more deliberate manner, or in a more deliberate manner, to the weavers and tenant farmers. And in this way, the people day boys and the defenders are seen as taking up positions on whether or not Catholics should have should enter the political life of the county or not, should be able to have a vote, should not be able to bear arms, um, and could take out mortgages on land. And these were the kind of key questions in around the Catholic question at that time. Also, you could sort of see the defenders and the, the people day boys, and there's evidence for this, that they're more involved in the wider debates over the French Revolution in the 17, from 1789 onwards, and during the propaganda that was reaching the county from the late 1780s. So that's the politicization theory, if you like. And, and as I said, probably both crudely put, but that's the, the gist of them. I think both theories have their strengths. Um, I'd kind of take a middle ground on this. 
I think one one it's not so much a weakness, but they they are talking about quite slightly different things in terms of the periods they cover. Um, Miller and Crawford's arguments are probably more about the period 1784 to 92, while the politicisation people are addressing themselves to really to the question of why an orange order emerged in Armagh and how, how come Armagh didn't rise in 1798. So there is an element of ships in the night about the two interpretations here, but there are important things I think to take from both of them. Um, and I think when, when you know, just to, before we get into the detail, the Armagh Charles, it's fair to say a few things really here to set out, and I can come back to this towards the end. The Armagh Troubles, if you like, of the 1780s and 1790s, have much of the same features found in agrarian protests across Ireland and in Armagh itself from the 1760s onwards. Many of, them, many of the problems in Armagh, as we'll see from the maps that I have, occur repeatedly in the same areas of the county, revealing tensions in the landlord tenant or, in fact, in the religious mix long before the 1790s. A second point I suppose to make here is that the violence in the county or the disturbances in the county can and should be divided into different phases here and this is the way I'll try and approach the thing you'll kind of see here on the timeline, I'll, I'll approach it in a number of different phases. You First of all you have, um, and this is, we, we'll come down to this the, from 1784 onwards, you have faction fights, then you have kind of arms raids, then you have a third is a clash between defenders and the volunteers and the military. Fourth, then you have localised clashes in South Armagh. And the final one is the, the battle for supremacy, which ended up back in North Armagh, mid Armagh, which is effectively ended by the diamond and the expulsions after that. But even to get to this stage, I want to kind of cover very briefly the Oak Boys and the Steel Boys who are in the title of it, because I think some of the features that we see later on can be found in that first these first outbreaks. Um, so I use the maps to try and, for those, and hopefully these are clear enough, I try to, in these maps, kind of show you where the, the centre of the Oak Boys are much in the round of the circle there, and then in the kind of the dotted triangle is the area where the Steel Boys appear in 1772. And these two, these two agrarian disturbances um, come out of what are kind of classical um, crowd activity over in, in the case of the Oak Boys, over tithes and county taxes called the Sayas, and also rents later. And in the case of the Steel Boys, over the kind of landlord tenant relations are about rents and security of lease, leases too. Um, what's interesting about these distinctions between, there's differences between the two. Des mentioned earlier about crowds coming out in the daytime as well as the nighttime. The Oak Boys were remarkably open in terms of their uh, activity in July 1793. They're marching along during the day, they're marching along quite openly, they're not too worried about who's identifying and who's not. They go, in this case, en masse to local landlords and other magistrates to get them to sign up to not collect the CS or the county tax in their area. Um, and in fact, some of the landlords they go to, much to the annoyance of government, actually kind of then entertain them at their houses. Um, so there's an openness to this. They're predominantly Presbyterian, um, in that though with a, a lot of uh, Catholic support in the south of the county, and there are a number of kind of uh, uh, kind of um, pieces of evidence in the in the poetry there, Art McCoy and others, in terms of their support for the Oak Boys at this time. Um, but it's, as I say, it's largely led that that movement are predominantly composed of Presbyterians, even in places that spreads from Armagh out um, to. Monaghan and Cavan later on, and even there, predominantly it's Presbyterians who are in the lead um, in predominantly Catholic counties. A different pattern then emerges really. The Oak Boys are quite successful in what they do. They come and go in a matter of weeks, and the county cess is not collected in parts of O'Neillant, Baronies, and in parts of Orier um, for much of the next six or seven years. So they're quite successful in what they do. The Steel Boys are different. 1772 sees the spread of that. It had begun in 1769 in Antrim um, over disputes on the Donegal estate, County Antrim, and by 1772 a spread to County Armagh and West Down. Um, and here it's a much different thing. They're kind of not, they're more secretive, they're more gathering by night. Um, and really they only burst into the open in Guildford in March 1772 where the Steel Boys gathered to rescue one of their number from the House of the Local Magistrate called Richard Johnson. Um, in this is quite a remarkable story, and I've kind of dealt with that elsewhere, 
the steel boys kind of attack the house of Johnson, um, pretty much they kind of shoot it up, shoot up the house. They're shot back at by uh, Johnson, and a Presbyterian minister, or Reverend Morel, is actually killed in that exchange of fire. He's in the house with Johnson. So there's a, a, a huge backlash to that, both within the county and elsewhere. But interestingly, one of the kind of interesting kind of facets of this is whilst Morel was killed and there was a, 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 an uproar over that locally, when it came to the bit, the local um, elite and also the government in Dublin didn't believe that the steel boys would get a fair trial, as they said, so, or they would have less of a chance of making convictions if they allowed those trials to go ahead in County Armagh. So the trials were shifted to Dublin in August of 1772 to try and get convictions. And this is a feature, um, as we see, of a lot of agrarian um, disturbances. They may not have been liked, there may have been a lot of kind of anger at them from among the local elite, but when it came to the local assizes, their peers and others um, were less likely to convict. Um, even in places like Tipperary, you, the problem there was that um, you had a difficulty there where landlords might try to seek a, a, a conviction of uh, local Catholic white boys, and there'd be problems with the petty juries actually getting them to convict. Um, and in some cases, they, they use special commissions um, in Tipperary to make convictions stick there. So the Steel Boys, again, come and go fairly quickly. Uh, a lot of the issues are sort of sorted out um, there. One of the, the features of, of them is a quite localised, again, in around that area. And more, um, an interesting point here is by 1772, it's less inclusive. Steel Boys are more openly anti-Catholic in their, in their propaganda as has survived, um, and a sense of more kind of strongly loyal to the government and loyal to the church and state um, than the Oak Boys would have felt that they needed to say. Maybe it was assumed by the Oak Boys that it would be believed by that, and the Steel Boys were making this case more clearly. And there are maybe uh, factors there that kind of come to bear then, again, in the uh, later on that troubles. At the end of a decade or so, where not a hell of a lot happens, um, in terms of crowd <coughs> behaviour, probably a lot of the um, energy is brought is kind of tied up then in the case of the volunteer movement, um, from which starts out in Armagh about seventeen County Armagh about seventeen seventy eight and runs up to the seventeen eighty three. That's its kind of heyday in Armagh those five years, and a lot of the, the excitement, the political excitement, was in and around um, that. And then in seventeen eighty four. That's often given us the start of the Armand Troubles. Now, as with a lot of these things, and you kind of find this when we come on to the Battle of the Diamond, there are fairly innocuous starts to these things. Basically, what happens in in this in the case of the Armand Troubles, the Armand Troubles start out very little more than a faction fight on the 4th of July, 1784, in Mount Norris or Port Norris. Mount Norris is probably ours better known um, uh, outside the county. And you can see, I'll, I'll sort of show you here. So basically, we're not, if you kind of look back here, just bear with me a moment. Oops. If you kind of see here, one of the points I made earlier is that we're going to see an awful lot of this repeating in around the same area um, of, uh, I hope nobody's from. Rich Hill or Loch Gaul, these places, but Rich Hill and Loch Gaul and these places are the centre of an awful lot of uh, this bother. But Mount Norris in July 1784 basically becomes the, the centre of activity. And a lot of it is to do with a number of factions gathered together. And this is a fairly at a fair and have, in this case, really what happens basically is the two, what are known as local fleets select their local champions and they duke it out literally at the fair. Um, one they gets the two brawlers are both Presbyterians. One then calls on a, another couple of people um, to to help out. So you always get like seconds coming in really to help them out or ringside people, I suppose in some way or another. And the issue becomes that the actual helper for the winner is a Catholic from Hamilton Spawn, which is not that far away. So he's actually come down, obviously, to the fair, helps out the winner, and all hell breaks loose over that summer uh, in the round Mount Norris. And what after the what are known as the kind of fleets um, are formed at Eden Napa, Hamilton Spawn, and Bunkers Hill. All of these are mixed religiously, and only the Napa uh, fleet 
uh, which is uh, sort of south of Mount, Mount Norris then, is a more exclusively um, Protestant one. And you have clashes at fairs right across the summer uh, of 1784. They even have their own kind of name, and there's posters put up on leaflets done at the same time. This is all quite nicely organised. They, they, it's more or less like calling you along to the local fair where you would see um, the fleets having it out, or their champions having it out at these. Um, the Hamilton Bond fleet, who is led by a former steel boy, comes out best in that summer, and a, a further fight is organised outside Hamilton Spawn, a faction fight is organised outside Hamilton Spawn on Whit Monday, 1785. Um, now the issue is, as this thing kind of escalates, arms start to become involved, not necessarily in the middle of the fight, but people seem to be start turning up not just to have it out with their fists and that, but their sticks, their stones, and in fact there are kind of rust, rusty muskets being brought out, some are, are assumed to be volunteer arms being brought out. Um, and allegedly, according to the newspaper reports at that time, the Whit Monday, uh, 1785 faction fight sees up to 1,400 men involved in that. It seems a bit of an exaggeration to me, but let's say it's in the hundreds anyway. People are turning up, so this has now become an issue of public order. Um, whereas a lot of the faction fights are probably tolerated to a certain degree, this is now you've got arms involved and you've got large numbers um, coming along to this. Um, William Richardson, one of the local Landlords from Rich Hill um, is make sure that this faction fight is called off and avoided at Whit mm -hmm. at Monday. Um, but on the way back home, the Nabak fleet, um, who were assisted by Mount Norris Protestants, beat a lot of the Hamilton spawn people. Some of them quite badly. And uh, again, it was reported at the time that one, as they often said, expired from their wounds after the fight. So there's a at least one death associated with that 1785, um, 1785 faction fight. One of the other factors in this is that you, you begin to see the denominational lines start to come out in terms of the fleets being organised in that. And they continue their fights and clashes throughout 1785, um, quite localised, um, centering in the circle as I, I've kind of uh, put it then around um, the Tandergee, Rich Hill, uh, Hamilton Spawn area, so it's in around there, and that's kind of the local man Richardson blamed the magistrates for being far too timid. They could have nipped this in the bud earlier if they hadn't. Um, but that said, given his pleas for the pardons for the Nabok men after the March uh, assizes of 1785, partiality comes into this issue too. And their internet denominational relations are worsening in that year. There's a talk of a reputed con conversion in Tully Saren that summer, where Protestants accused a Catholic priest of intervening on a deathbed, and he answered in a kind of pamphlet board to deny this. So denominational relations are worsening in and around this area in 1785. The second phase then, as I've kind of marked it there, is that arms raids, and that's the kind of the, um, it's the vertical circle, if you like, really, and that. Uh, in a sense, they probably could have stretched that up a little bit more, but in a sense, really, you're you're looking at the, the area around Rich Hill, down as far as um, Fork Hill, really, in the south. And there's arms raids along the way there. And these are a cause, really, of de desperate bitterness at the time. And they turn tr the troubles in 1786-87 into something more approaching a kind of a religious um, or denominational battle. What should we say at first, I suppose, that the raiding of arms is only part of what goes on because houses are wrecked as well as arms being raided for, um, and mostly Catholic houses at this stage, the arms, arms raids are pretty much one way. Furniture is broken and looms are destroyed, which puts people out of um, economic business really at the time too. The possession of arms is really the key question at this stage, and it, it begins to fit into a much wider, fits the troubles into a much more wider context of national politics around the Catholic question, and the right to bear arms. Um, again, if you go back to the, the states at the moment, this it still remains a key issue from the 18th century onwards in some parts of the world. And to understand the significance of that, as I say, I mentioned earlier with the volunteer movement um, being seen in 1778 onwards. In many parts of Ulster, the volunteers were predominantly, most parts of Ulster, I should say, the, dominates, the volunteers are, are dominated by uh, Protestant tenant farmers and in the towns by 
um, merchants, artisans, you know, the better off middle class. In some rural areas, they in inevitably include former steel boys and oak boys, which angered a lot of local conservatives. Um, and they were through drilling, parading in uniform, and attending county or local reviews. And in Armagh, that's the same. There were about 30 companies, ranging from 30 to 120 men, formed in Armagh between 1778 and 1784, according to George Patterson's work. A few of the landed elite could afford to ignore the movement, with the exception, really, of Lord Gosford, one of the key leading government supporter in the county. The volunteers led by Lord Charnham were mostly reformers and went into the three demands of free trade, which was granted in 1779. Legislative independence for the Dublin Parliament, which was gained in 1782 after the Dungannon Convention of Volunteers, and parliamentary reform, which was never to be gained, but remained a kind of constant demand of the volunteers after 1782. The Armagh volunteers, like many across the county, or the country I should say, are divided on whether Catholics, this was a further demand from some radical volunteers, whether Catholics should or should not be admitted into political life. Some volunteers were totally against any further relief for Catholics after the 1778 Act, which was passed on uh, taking out mortgages on land. And a majority would have allowed some further reforms, perhaps, on education and marriage but only a very small number were in full or favour of full emancipation at this stage. And these divisions in, were reflected in Armagh and would have reflected, the, I think, the views probably of Armagh's Protestant population at this time, most opposed to anything other than minor reforms for Catholics um, and only a small number in favour of kind of wider radical reforms. Lord Charlemont and most of the volunteers who were in the lead of the volunteers would, wouldn't admit Catholics into the volunteer movement um, as, they, uh, as, would, as that would have been a sign, if they were bearing arms, would have been a sign of admittance into the body politic. And this was a position supported by most Irish patriots at the time. So you can kind of see the bearing of arms becomes an important issue. Um, Henry Grattan and some others at a local level, like the volunteer companies of Francis Dobbs of Acton, and John Blackhall, the agent to the Cope Estates outside, and the captain of the Loch, Hall, Loch Gall volunteers disagreed with this. So you have a number of companies locally that had Catholic members in and around Acton. Um, the attempt by Blackhall to make an, an open offer to widen the, the membership of the Loch Gall company in 1784, in June 1784, creates a, an enormous backlash to that. And in some senses, it shows how the volunteers' day had passed by 1784, um, so we'll never really know how many Catholics would have actually joined up if the offer had been there for them. But the arms question becomes key, and if it appears in various guises, it appears in whether or not Catholics should be admitted into the volunteers. It also, interestingly, I said earlier that Gosford was no supporter of the volunteers, but interestingly, Gosford was one of the first to arm Catholics, some of his tenants in 1784, um, to try and stop robberies on his estate. I like the Loch Gall gesture by John Blackhall, this move by the Lord Gosford was soon caught up in the justification um, by what become the Peeba Day Boys for their raids um, on what they could construe to be illegally held arms. The name of the Peeba Day Boys emerges in 1784-85 uh, uh, due to the time and day of the raids, basically I said they're held, they're supposedly happened in the early hours of the morning. Um, it also the Peeba Day Boys is not a name exclusive to Armagh. It appears in County Meath in the previous decade um, where Catholics were members. So a lot of these names like Hearts of Steel, Hearts of Oak, Hearts of Flint, uh, Peeba Day Boys are recurring names in, in various kind of uh, parts of the country uh, for agrarian troubles. The raids of sales were often violent, um, as I say, targeting Catholics and tenants, farmers and weavers, and were often carried out on an estate by estate basis as the Peeba Day Boys groups got organised on those estates. From contemporary reports, the raid might be carried out from between 30 and 100 people, some of them armed, some on horses, who called the person out and then entered the house, often at night or, as I say, in the early morning. Um, raids, given the nature of this, were often accompanied by violence against persons and destruction of property. Looms being a particular, uh, weaving looms being a particular target of that destruction. Um, so it's not just about arms, it's about kind of um, economic rivalries here as well. And that goes back to uh, Crawford and Miller's view on the kind of socio-economic uh, issues. Given that there couldn't have been that many arms to go around, 
and people were unlikely to hold them in their houses after the first raids began, then intimidation and I think economic reasons are a key feature of this of this phase. Other features then, as I say, um, of this phase two of the, the arms raids is attacks are localised um, and the victims were entirely dependent on the response of the local landlord and or magistrate to act or not act. There was an increasing use by some magistrates who were of army detachments who were called out of barracks, um, particularly around Rich Hill, where there, or where the magistrate was active and called for army support. John Moore of John Banneher is a key feature in this. We'll, we'll, he'll reappear uh, again in 1788-89. And then as in 1763 or 72, it's almost impossible to get petty juries to convict some of the people Day Boys suspects, which became a cause of great anger um, among some of the gentry, and undoubtedly great resentment among Catholics who saw partiality in this. By 1787, in response to this, we begin to see emergence of Catholic, what you may call self-help groups, using pickets, horns, and symbols, first the Bally McNab, and then by that autumn of 1787, taking the battle to their enemies at fairs along the lines of the earlier faction fights, and they begin to get <coughs> the name of the defenders. One crucial thing to note is that the Whigs in general, the Whig gentry, which was mostly of the gentry really, their reformist gentry in Armagh, were very, and we need to kind of question why they were very reluctant to call out the army. Um, they believed that the volunteers should be doing that work, even though the volunteers had largely worn down at this stage. And there were some observers, some observers because of this, including the Reverend William Campbell, a Presbyterian minister in Armagh City, who accused basically some magistrates of connivance in the violence because he as a Whig believed they wanted to destroy what was left of the volunteer movement of Patriot Spirit. Other magistrates, uh, Richardson of Rich Hill, John Ogle of Fathom, believed that the magistrates feared becoming unpopular and therefore wouldn't use the army. In any case, it meant that these arms raids went on almost untouched at that time, and, and as I say, in a, in a very localised manner. We see a different phase now in the third one, and that is the emergence of the defenders and the spread of Lodges, Defender Lodge across much of Armagh into Larry and West Down. And then I'll come to the second uh, point there about the violence in South Armagh, which I think can be treated slightly separately, but I'll come back to that. In terms of the, where are these, that's the, the Fork Hill uh, thing, which I'll come to in a minute. Really, in terms of the Defenderism, the Defenderism begins to kind of happen <coughs> kind of around that sort of vertical uh, circle stretching down to Fork Hill, really in, in and around that, in response to the arms raid. So you can kind of keep that in your, your mind. It's in and around Market Hill, but getting down almost as far as Newry at this stage. The defenders are probably fairly well known to people, so I won't deal an awful lot with it, but just to, suffice to say, really, they're, it, it are pretty much, um, they set the tone in this, in this phase of 1788-89. And it, it's, it's a period that's really dominated by the Defenders being on the front foot and the people day boys being on the back foot. And it's a, a growing assertiveness and disliked assertiveness, it has to be said, of uh, Catholics against what had been happening in the, the armed, uh, in the arms raids. And in response to that then, volunteer companies being revived, or new volunteer companies as they were, being revived, and in a very aggressive manner dealing with the, the, the defenders. So you have a fairly open clashes between defenders and the volunteer companies or the army. Um, so much so that by July 1789, uh, John Fitzgibbon, the, the Lord Chancellor, was writing angrily to Lord Charlotte to just ask, to ask just when the magistrates of County Armagh were going to act, as up to 500 Catholics had refused to disperse outside Newry until the army had eventually been summoned after a day-long standoff there. Fitzgibbon's view was that the magistrates were falling down on the jaw and allowing a bad situation to become worse. Um, and this becomes the real debate in Armagh. Should the magistrates intervene? Should they try and do things in a more informal manner? Is it, I suppose it's an issue here for agrarian troubles throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. When do crowds spill over into public order um, issues? In terms of the spread of defenderism, the evidence from 1788-9 is that the, what would soon become seen as a mass Catholic conspiracy was largely, at this stage, the product of uh, a localised response to the arms raids and 
you know, the idea that it was a mass conspiracy in the 70s, 80, 80, 89, is probably more to do with the imaginations of those who were saying it was, as opposed to it actually being that. But John Moore is an interesting character in this. John Moore was a Moore of John Banneher estate near Points Pass, Jared's Pass direction. And Moore was a very close friend of Lord Charlemont, a reformer, a supporter of parliamentary reform, a supporter of all the Patriot causes at this stage, probably even to the, the radical side of that. But, um, and indeed a good landlord to his, his mixed uh, tenantry. However, he became very worried about defenders in and around his local area. Um, and in a sense, it's the uh, happenstance of these things. It's the kind of things that can happen. They can spark a bad situation and make it worse. A Catholic crowd gather on St. John's Eve in 1788 uh, to celebrate St. John's Eve on his estate. And in response, Moore, for wisely or not, decides to assemble the volunteers to disperse the crowd. And from one account, the crowd turned lovely when Moore demanded that they handed over garlands and being used as part of the celebration. Um, although a newspaper and, a, and a, another newspaper report actually blames the volunteers for overreacting. Whoever was to blame, um, the result was that they, there was a clash there, and Moore went from being a sort of a, seen as a friend to his Catholic tenants to be seen as an enemy, and this starts to happen across the county um, in this period. And in turn, this leads to more violent, violent clashes around 1788 89. Uh, local, one example of that was in the autumn of 1789, a company of local volunteers returning, was processing and returning from Ben Burb and clashed with defenders outside that, uh, near Ben Burb, outside Armagh. A group of soldiers are summoned from Armagh uh, by the magistrates and arrest a number of Catholics. And in fact, in this one, it's kind of a sign that, unlike at uh, John Banner, both sides are prepared to use not only fists, but also stick stones and, and swords and guns at this stage. So, Things are kind of escalating to a worrying case really in 1788-89. And as I say, again these things are localised but spreading uh, in a way. Now, by 1789 the other thing that happens then is really the, obviously the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789. And after that period the sort of spreading of revolutionary ideas into Ireland. And that has a, an effect on the defenders and also in its own way has an effect on the people day boys and, and their later um, incarnation of the Orange Order. And so you have the religious battles that are here that begin to become overlain with um, political issues really and whether or not you were supporting, whether if not if you supported reform, you were in favour of French revolutionary ideas, you were in favour of moderate reform, or you were entirely opposed to reform in an Edmund Burke manner, but was reform only led to chaos. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a split over the revolutionary ideas as well. I mentioned earlier about South Armagh. South Armagh is in a sense, uh, it's kind of marginal to this whole story. Uh, again, if people, if people in Rich Hill wouldn't like me to hear me say that, but South Armagh is quite marginal to this story. But there is something that happens in 1790 to 1791 in around Hill that in a sense gains a greater prominence than it has in this particular story, it turns out it's a bit of an outlier. It stands out as an issue, and it's a very, very local issue around the uh, estate of Richard Jackson, who had died in 1787. Kyla Madden and uh, Janine Behan have dealt with this in, in, in great detail. Um, but it's a, it's a curious one. Really, what happens in there has much to do with them. Um, uh, it's almost like a classic agrarian thing as opposed to what's happening elsewhere in the county at that stage. And it is to do with, uh, on the one hand, it's to do with the fact that uh, Jackson wanted to improve his estate and his trustees after his death wanted to kind of further improve it with linen and um, with improving the, you know, insisting on improving clauses and leases. Um, in some cases, signing up uh, Protestant tenants as opposed to Catholic tenants as perhaps more likely to be improvers as the Catholics were. And a whole issue there around sort of economic development in around Fork Hill. It's a fascinating story in and of itself. It is a little tangential to what goes on elsewhere in one hand because it is so to do with that. But basically what happens, just to sort of tell you what happens in there, is that there's a Reverend Edward Hudson, who's the rector at Fork Hill. Again, like John Moore of Banner, John Banneher, good friend of Charlemont, 
uh, modern reformer, remains a modern reformer throughout the 1790s, doesn't turn his back on Charlemagne and Patriot reform, but becomes very concerned about what's happening as he sees it with defenders and aggressive uh, Catholics in and around the Fourth of the State. Much of this is to do with Hudson's own personality, I suspect, but Hudson decides he's going to take on the defenders locally. Um, on the one hand, by kind of trying to seek out arresting defenders, in the other, in the other, supporting uh, other improvers on the estate, like the school schoolmaster Alexander Barclay and his two brothers-in-law, uh, William Duncan and the other brother-in-law. Name escapes me just at the moment. Um, but these are all kind of key figures. They're tithe proctors. They're as I said, the local school teacher, the local uh, Church of Ireland minister there. So these are kind of key people within the small Protestant community in the room, Forkill at this stage, and become very unpopular with the local defenders. There is a rumour that one of uh, Barclay's brother-in-law has uh, desecrated uh, Catholic vestments in a break into the local church in the room, Craigan at this stage, unproved rumour, but a rumour nonetheless. And in January 1791, a crowd come to Barclay's house looking for Barclay and for his uh, brother-in-law, Duncan. They break into the house, they stab and they mutilate uh, Barclay. They stab his wife, who later died from her wounds, and they wound two other people. William Duncan isn't in the house at this stage. So, you know, the situation there, and this becomes a cause celebre, really, and gets tied into the wider defender movement. This is, in a sense, this is seen as kind of sectarian atavism at its worst, really, in... Uh, 1791 and is repeated as an atrocity story like the kind of 1641 atrocity stories um, throughout the 19th century you know the Barclay killing and mutilation um, loses nothing in the telling really as, as the late 18th century winds itself into the 19th century I think it's a little tangential um, to what's going on but in a sense what it does show is that the lodges of defenders have spread into South Armagh across South Armagh um, and into North Louth and West Down at this stage. And I think bear in mind here that this is the time where Wolf Tone and Thomas Russell are over the border in, into County Down in the Red Ruff and so on in 1791 92, trying to sort of peace make there in the Red Ruff with, um, with the Presbyterian ministers there um, to try and kind of make peace among the, between defenders and, and local Protestants there. Um, and you know, also a situation where other United Irishmen, uh, Navratandi and others, see the potential in the defenders to actually become a, a, an ally of the, the United Irishmen movement that's spreading at this time too. So you have a, a whole load of different things going on here. Um, but the defenders become very strong in the south of the county and that's possibly why they become important to the, it's not possibly, it's why they become important to really to the diamond um, story and in some senses, the resurgence of defender people day boy violence in North and Mid Armagh is to do with what's happening in that area in 1794-95, but it's also due to the fact that defenders are moving in from other areas, from South Armagh and also from Tyrone, as we'd see in the case of the Diamond, um, to, to actually intervene in events in North Armagh and in many ways worsen events that are there. So I'm kind of conscious of the time here. What I'll try and maybe do um, is get to the sexual story of the Battle of the Diamond itself. If you really want the detail of this, the day-to-day -day detail of this, where, where I would recommend you go um, for that is uh, Brendan McAvoy's articles in Shana and Sardwa that were published back in the 1980s, 1986-87, and around then. He published them over two years, and it's incredibly detailed in terms of the day-to-day. -day. Uh, it's a, it's a, as a, a reconstruction of events, it's a, probably a, a masterpiece of doing that, of how it happened, who was involved, why it happened and so on. So the mid-1980s, 86, 87, Shana and Sarwa is the place to go to. I couldn't, uh, it'd be here for tomorrow if you try to reconstruct events in the amount of detail that McAvoy does. But let me try and give you a little bit of a flavour of, of that summer. 1784, you basically have a reserve of same problems again and you really are into people day boys and the defenders going at it hammer and tongs really. In this stage, uh, the autumn assizes of 1784 here indictments for riots in Lurgan, for riots at a fair in Kelly Lea just outside Armagh, and for riots at other places uh, north of Armagh City, northern kind of 
um, west, yes, no, east of our mass city, just looking at the map there, east of our mass city. And I've tried to do that in around that circle there of where the center of this is, with the wee uh, star being where I like, can best kind of place where the diamond is itself. So in a situation there is a complicating factor really now in this as well. I mentioned earlier about the army. The army had been sort of taken, the army was still there in large numbers, but the army was now supplemented by the militia regiments which had been formed in 1793. And in North Armagh, you have two predominantly Protestant militia companies um, there. The, the Dublin City Regiment, commanded by John Gifford, and the North Mayo Militia, which were based in and around, supported down in Armagh. And they become kind of central uh, to this story. In other places, the defenders actually try to recruit uh, militia members to into the defenders and the Allied Irishmen try to do that most famously with the Monaghan militia but in this case they certainly aren't gaining recruits in among uh, these two militia regiments and as I say there's also a feeling here of the among the people day boys that the defenders have gained a, a, a march on them to and so you have debates in 1794-95 among local Protestants that the people day boys had served their purpose and needed now to be kind of developed into a more lodge based with a central structure organization as people believe the defenders were operating on that way so this is kind of where some of the ideas for the orange order begin to circulate in 1794 james wilson of the dian being key to that in terms of that idea of a lodge type structure for the protestant um, organizations at this stage um, in the meantime before that happens Papering and racking begins again in North Armagh. Papering basically was where houses would be paper slapped up in them and then the houses were wrecked. They were never burned, they were never totally destroyed because in a sense if people were expelled out of them, other tenants might be able to come into that. But uh, predominantly the, the targets of this again become Catholics but not exclusively Protestant tenants were also targeted by the defenders and the revenge attacks. What's also kind of interesting about this and again a little bit like what happens in Fork Hill is that the diamond becomes a kind of central part of this. McAvoy treats and, and details this very very well and it becomes almost a it almost becomes like a sort of a, a vortex into which people are pulled. Really it's a local turf war um, when it gets down to the bit. It's a, a valley and a small hamlet or village um, with a, the centre being you can kind of go now you would sort of I think there's actually maybe two places people say you can go to or Dan Winter's Cottage or in is supposed to be, but I'm not going to argue over the, the actual location of that, but Dan Winter was probably one of the key, Dan Winters I should say, was one of the key people. There was a public house or in there, and in 1794-95 it becomes a, it is a meeting place for local people today, boys. Um, the details are very personal and feud-like, really, almost like the battles of, it's almost like a return to the battles of the fleets back in 1784. A cockfight at Winter's Cottage turns violent in late May 1780, or 1795, and there's a three-day standoff in June between rival sides who refuse to disperse until the military are sent for. Um, partial partisan local magistrates are, are actually involved in this, particularly on the people Day Boys side, uh, Joseph Atkinson being one of the magistrates there. And the respectable people in Kilmore Parish, as they were known, including to a local Church of Ireland minister and magistrate, condemn the violence, um, look for li Winter's license to be withdrawn from, and proclaim that they will work for friendship and not feuds at this time. But really, they're quite marginalised by this stage. Robert Quigley um, attempts on the Catholic side to try and um, quell the problems from uh, on the defender's side. And one thing he tries to do is have Jim Sloan arrested um, and have his premises closed after balance the block call fair on the 1st of July. Instead, Sloan accuses Catholic, who was briefly arrested, of raiding for arms in his house. Um, and Sloan's become becomes the centre of a second riot on the 4th of September 1795. So you have in and around the kind of the block call uh, diamond area in that sort of circle, and then uh, closer in and around the, the star there, you have. Um, Defenders in the area calling for outside help or to try and force a battle to resolve this once and for all. You have magistrates who are largely, local magistrates who are largely committed to breaking the defenders and increasingly siding with the people day boys. Werner 
of Churchill, Atkinson, of Crowhill, a number of people like that, um, have been doing this for years. Others have signed on to do this as well. Jacob Turner being another one out of fear of the other side um, in recent years. Even partial neutrals, um, like I think Robert Quigley at this stage, uh, trying to patch up truces, but in a sense becoming increasingly marginal to the, the local events. Um, the United Irishmen and Father Quigley are also involved in that, but in a sense, you know, they have their own agendas here too. So there's a kind of a thing going on there as well. And in the, in early or mid September, you have two because of the call for defenders to come from outside, you have two defender camps or encampments that are established in mid September in Annickmore and Fothert Hill. First one's broken up, and the second one is to break up after yet another truce is negotiated. Um, but the problem is the word doesn't get back out and reinforcements come from Tyrone, White Cross and Katie, and this is the group that decide to raid Winter's Cottage um, in the early hours of Monday the 21st of September. Uh, it's one hill fired on one side of the diamond and the other is a Grange Moor Hill on the other side where the Peepa Day Boys gather. Quite disciplined firing begins from the Peepa Day Boys and retreat by the, the defenders who get down as far as Winter's Cottage and break into that. A retreat by them turns into a rout and between the clashes over a few days, between 30 and 50 people are killed. So this is on the scale, unseen really, uh, before in the, the Armand troubles up to that. The aftermath, in a sense, um, of all of this is that the Arma, the Ar sorry, the Orange Order is founded, and more immediately, um, what you would actually see is a, a three months of expulsions of local Catholics, um, and there are kind of evidence then of Catholics ending up as far away as Mayo. Um, some of the expelled Catholics end up being pretty much in, not transported to Mayo, but being found a, a welcome home over in County Mayo in the Brown Estates there. Uh, Patrick Toll has done work on that. And they got, until Gosford actually condemns both the Peepa Day Boys and what he calls the Supine Magistracy, Magistracy in December 1795. Um, the other aftermath the, after the Orange Order on these expulsions is that defenders, including Robert Quigley at this stage, seek a full alliance with the United Irishmen which becomes a key part of the story after 1795 as well. So that, that's the kind of the, the tail end of it. As I say, in a sense what I would try to do, and I, as a, I, I apologise for the fact that it's been such a kind of quick whistle tour stop through the whole thing, but it's a, you could in a sense give three lectures on three different things here. But I've been trying to kind of bring events back home and give you a sense of what's happening in the county. These events aren't happening in a vacuum, they're happening in um, you know, a history which reaches into Britain, a history which reaches into uh, the events of the French Revolution, and the aftermath, in a sense, with the Orange Order, reaches not only back into Britain, but into the imperial regions, British imperial regions of North America, Australasia, and indeed Africa, really with the spread of the Orange Order. But it begins locally here. It begins, in a sense, in quite local feuds, in quite local things that external events have a, an impact on. And also I think this imperial reach of the Orange Order is neither inevitable nor, to be honest, um, you know, in a sense, what, you know, it was to, in some sense it is purely defined in what uh, Charles Hammond and Teeling dismissed as a rustic encounter. The Orange Order really, when you kind of think about it locally, is a reaction to what they would have said to oppose Catholic aggressiveness, whether this was assumed or actually found in evidence, um, and becomes, in a sense, something about that as well as kind of a, a thing that kind of um, overlays, you know, people day boy violence against Catholics from the 1780s and some of the earlier rhetoric and propaganda there in the Steel Boys in particular. So you have a, you have a kind of a history there in Armagh that gives birth to the Orange Order. The Orange Order then, in a sense, becomes something quite different, um, and, uh, or at least they say leadership of the Orange Order, I suppose, um, after that, try to make it something seem like something quite different to um, what, it, what, it's, what it given, the events that it given birth to. So there's a kind of a, a quandary there, I suppose, for, for histories of the Orange in a sense of celebrating what happened in the diamond if you don't really sort of see what happened locally and try and treat that locally um, and then try to say that something different.
I, I can maybe kind of deal with that a bit more if people have questions on that. Um, this larger history, I think, shouldn't has tend to blind as to what was actually happening on the ground in Carty Armagh in the decades before 1795, but also in the days and weeks running up to the Battle of the Diamond. And I hoped, I hope in a sense, I try to address a little bit of that today when I try to sort of say that what is happening in Armagh has a kind of a trajectory going back to the 1760s that kind of lasts then into the uh, 19th century as well. Whilst you have the orange and the defenders into the Ribbon Societies later in the 1790s, that tradition of agrarian troubles continue. The Tommy, Tommy Downshire's boys in the 1820s that Alan Blackstock has dealt with um, and, other, um, uh, yeah, and other events in the, in the 19th century there as well. So you, you that, these two traditions go along hand in hand, sometimes intersecting, sometimes clashing with one another. As I say, I suppose when you're trying to think of the history of the Orange Order or the history of ribbonism and so on, it's important to bear in mind what's happening locally. Um, there has as much of an effect on what's happening in the outside world. And I'll leave it at that. It's two o'clock now, so I'd be time if there's any questions. Thanks very much.